All right. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to get going. Organovo is a 3D bioprinting company based here in San Diego. Um, public company, so I have to use uh, forward-looking statements, of course. Uh, disclaimer here. Um, we're on the we're traded on the Nasdaq ticker is ONVO. Um, Organovo uh, was an early member of ARM. Um, we've been around for about almost eight years now here in San Diego. And uh, from the beginning, we had licensed the earliest 3D bioprinting technologies. So we own the exclusive licenses to both the earliest Clemson technology and the University of Missouri technology. Have a very strong IP position in the space and are seen as the clear leader in the creation of 3D human tissues using bioprinting. Um, we've grown to become a commercial company already. Uh, we have multiple products. We launched our most recent product in September of this year, and we went commercial off of using tissues for in vitro research. So we offer uh, a suite of tissue services for pharma companies for toxicological testing, both a liver tissue and a kidney proximal tubule. Uh, the liver's been out for over a year, and the kidney uh, tissue is the one that launched in September. Uh, we have a growing set of customers in this space and a growing revenue base. Um, about seven of the top 25 uh, global pharma companies are already using this. And we've been recognized uh, over time as a leader in this space with a number of accolades uh, as we've grown the company. Uh, currently about 120 employees in uh, about 4, 000, uh, 45,000 square feet here in San Diego um, and uh, about a $400 million market cap. Um, we've grown to have a large number of customers. Uh, uh, some of them, of course, you know well. Um, and corporate customers and partners are on this slide. Uh, we have a large deal with Merck where they're a, uh, both a user of the tox services, the, the liver tox in particular. Obviously, that's been out longer. And then uh, also we're building multiple disease models for them on a, on a custom basis for use in eventual screening for, for, new, uh, for drug efficacy. We'll talk a little bit about that use of our, our technology as well and a large partnership with L'Oreal in 3D skin, uh, working to build skin models for both efficacy and safety testing there. Um, we also have a number of academic partnerships. Uh, over time, we do expect to use more of these uh, bioprinting methods in creation of therapeutic tissues. One of the challenges in that space is certainly vascularization, and so we've partnered with a number of academic centers like Yale School of Medicine to provide our bioprinting technology for use in their labs using federal research money to overcome some of the vascularization problems. And I'll get to a little bit later how we use the technology today given vascularization challenges. Um, we think about uh, all, each tissue as a platform of opportunity. So we've worked in a large number of tissue areas to date, uh, liver tissue, lung tissue, kidney oncology uh, tissues, breast cancer tumor models in particular, which I don't have time to talk about or show you the information about today. Um, I mentioned some of these others as well. Vascular, um, blood vessels for bypass was an early interest of the company because of the work of the founding professor. Um, and as I've said, we have launched in a preclinical safety um, uh, in vitro product and service mode. Um, and so that's what's driving our revenue growth. That's the first column you see there of use. But an investment, for example, in a liver tissue for that use provides a healthy tissue that can be used for tox testing. And we do that work in a service mode today. So pharma companies send us their compounds. We test them here in San Diego. We give them the results of that testing. Um, but also, the same investment in uh, healthy liver tissue can yield a disease model next. So it's a very small additional investment to get to a disease model. And I'll talk, for example, in liver tissue, how we've taken that healthy liver tissue and now are building liver fibrosis models. Those are the types of things that can be useful in uh, disease modeling and screening purposes, target identification and screening purposes. And then the same tissue can also become a potential therapeutic opportunity. So again, by building a platform uh, or a base understanding of a liver tissue, um, we've now come to the point where we can take that base liver tissue and our understanding of how to build 3D bioprinted liver and the complexity of it and move to use it therapeutically. So this is an announcement we just made this morning in conjunction with the meeting here. Um, we've announced that human liver tissue for transplant is our first therapeutic opportunity that we're pursuing formally. Um, we had been pursuing a number of preclinical models over time, a number of different tissues, and investing about 15% of our R&D uh, money in doing this, um, and we had been very closed-mouthed, closed-lipped, tight-lipped about what we were actually doing because we want to have a confidence that we can get to the point of an IND. And so for the first time, I'm able to say now that we are pursuing a liver tissue, and our intent is to take that forward for 
for uses in both um, uh, in, uh, errors of metabolism and also acute on chronic liver failure. Um, and so if you're thinking about what this would be used for as a bridge to transplant for a patient with um, liver failure who is potentially going to be on the transplant waiting list but doesn't have um, uh, an expectation to get a, a transplant soon, we can bridge them for a year or more is our expectation if we achieve what we hope to clinically and give them value, keep them out of the hospital during that time. To do this, we do face the limitations of bioprinted tissue and, and tissue engineering in general because um, vascularization is still such a challenge in the field. So instead of thinking about building a full organ, we're trying to impact patients with what we can do today, which is build patches of up to a millimeter or more in thickness. Um, we can't fully vascularize tissues, no one can, and there are traditional limits of tissue engineering that you have to be within a couple hundred microns of a surface in order to not have necrosis and death of the cells. We've overcome some of those by the ability to induce microvascular networks, and I'll show you some evidence of that in these tissues. That allows us to get to a millimeter plus in thickness, and what we're doing is thinking about a dollar bill sized patch that we can deliver directly and has enough mass to dramatically impact that patient. So if you're talking about someone who has the acute, um, acute on chronic liver failure, uh, they may have 10 to 15 percent remaining liver function, and we're looking to double that, get, deliver a patch that can give them 10 to 15 percent additional liver mass um, and can be fully functional and so double effectively their function. Um, we're, do, we're doing this and we're taking the step forward because we've had very strong early results in animals. So we've seen very strong engraftment and vascularization of the tissues, and we have detection of human um, liver-specific proteins and metabolic enzymes in the tissue um, detected from the, from the animal serum. Um, and we're looking to move this forward for IND submission within three to five years. As I said, we've got strong early data, and we, this is a general observation that the bioprinted liver and other tissues that we've bioprinted rapidly engraft in a host. So we've seen now very strong evidence across a number of tissues that are bioprinted and transplanted that these tissues do engraft well. Um, we think we're very confident in our ability to continue to produce other tissues and move those forward and get engraftment and, and activity. And specifically with the liver, of course, then we've had to detect human liver proteins and enzymes uh, in, in, the, in the rodent. We can detect that in the serum, and these grafts are well tolerated, and we don't see any injury. We see persistence of the grafts over a period of time. We are deferring release of a full scientific set of data until the ter termus meeting, a scientific conference. Obviously, we're in the sort of partnering uh, meeting of this conference uh, making the announcement, but uh, we'd like to show the, the um, scientific data at a, at a larger conference for the scientific side. And um, I'm able to only show you a little bit of data for that reason, but you can see here the robust vascularization that I'm talking about, um, the presence of albumin in these graphs, um, human albumin detected in the rodent model. And we get a large network of well-perfused microvessels out over time, as I mentioned. Um, and you can see the, the lumen form, and you can see the red blood cells present in these um, out over time in the, in the tissue sections. And as I said, beyond this data, we have data showing the presence in the serum as well um, of, of both albumin and other, and other molecules that are relevant. So how did we get to this point? We've been building on the platform that we had built. As I mentioned, having the liver tissue built out for the in vitro uses has allowed us to do that. And I'll tell you a little bit more detail as I, as I can do that about the in vitro liver tissue. Um, that is built from three different cell types. And what bioprinting bins, built, brings to the table is the ability to build uh, a complex architecture with multiple cells and create a 3D structure. That's how we get to better liver function and better predictive results in toxicology and eventually, we hope, in disease models uh, for such a system. Whereas hepatocytes in 2D culture are known to rapidly start to fail, lose phenotype. They also never show complete liver function. For example, cholesterol biosynthesis and things like that are hard to see. Um, we can actually get quite robust liver function over time. And we have a nice set of histology results that show that we're getting tight junctions in these and other aspects of normal structure. And you can again see the, um, the lumens forming in the upper left here. That's true in these small settings, these in vitro models too, which are about three millimeters in diameter and half a millimeter thick, but still three-dimensional, um, having about 20 cell layer thickness. 
and we get a robust set of things that show us that this liver tissue conserves normal liver biology in ways that are simply not achievable with other, other models. Animal models clearly have gaps because of the species difference, and 2D hepatocytes have well-known challenges and are the reason for so many late-stage failures. So phase three and um, later failures for, for t drugs due to liver tox is because of the poverty of prediction of the early models. That's not to say that we don't have really strong prediction overall. You've got to imagine 90 to 95 percent um, success, but you do take a risk when you get put any drug into human trials that you're not going to find uh, the liver tox problem until quite late, and that results, of course, in dramatic losses, usually a billion dollars or more. Um, some companies have paid up nearly a billion dollars just in lawsuit settlements if they've damaged a, patient's, a number of patients' livers. Um, so we have a very tight set of data that shows with multiple molecules, for example, that we saw the toxicity of these classic misses by about seven days in our system. There's a variety of reasons for that, but the big picture is that we conserve normal function and can see that. Um, I mentioned disease models in the liver tissue. This is a very good example of what, where we can get to with disease models and the, the greater power of potential prediction in this space. So 2D hepatocytes can be a little bit helpful in tox, a tox setting, but there are no trusted models today in, in liver fibrosis. It's a very challenging area, and you don't see a lot of drugs being developed um, for that reason, or we're striving to develop better drugs, but the lack of good animal models is holding things back. Um, a number of things have been taken forward into the clinic based on early animal models that haven't proved to be pred predictive. So this is an example of where we can be quite predictive and hope, to, and we see a lot of um, uh, concordance between our results and um, human biology. This is a methotrexate-induced fibrosis model using our standard liver tissue. Um, researchers at the University of North Carolina exposed that to methotrexate on a chronic basis, multiple weeks, and this tissue does persist for six weeks or more, and so we can do that. And you see in the, in the one micromolar um, sample there, at, at two weeks, you see quite a robust set of, of formation of the uh, fibrotic phenotype. And this matches, the, the histology of this closely matches what you see in a human sample, which, and, and that means bridging fibrosis as well as nodular fibrosis in, the, in these samples. So you see a nice formation of that. In addition, it, the, the um, pathology of this disease and how things play out over time is very well conserved in our model. So if you look at this, um, at the chart there, you'll see that we don't see elevation of, of liver enzymes with the methotrexate induced uh, or exposed samples um, at seven days. However, we do see that bridging fibrosis. We do see the pathology start to show up in the histology samples at seven days, and only later do you see it in the, in the, um, in the blood chemistry. And so very clearly we're matching a number of things about this that makes it very exciting to partner with pharma and to use this more broadly in disease modeling and prediction. And finally, the most recent tissue that we've launched, I mentioned, uh, in the in vitro setting is kidney. We're very interested, broadly speaking, in kidney. We do expect to at least look at kidney as a, uh, a therapeutic tissue as well over time and evaluate that. Um, but for now, what we're able to do, because we can build architecture and get to structure, is to build a kidney proximal tubule model. Um, proximal tubule is only one part of the kidney. Kidney is obviously quite complex and harder to bioprint overall. Um, but the proximal tubule does require architecture. So if you just take the, the renal epithelial cells and put those on a dish, they have a very limited predictive power and they're known to miss a lot of things. They're not broadly utilized for that reason. In fact, it's hard to buy uh, donor uh, kidney cells on the open market because they're not avidly sold into pharma because there's not a demand. Um, but with this model, we hope to create a very strong demand, and we've seen strong early demand. What we're able to do is get strong epithelial function um, because we do create this structure and have the renal fibroblasts at the base, and we have an intact um, barrier function on that, as well as a broad spectrum of transporter function seen in the epithelial cells. So normal function is measured by GGT um, of the proximal tubule and the epithelial cells. Um, but most interesting to pharma is especially the expression of transporters. This has gone beyond our expectations for the data set here. Um, so SGL, SGLT2, OCT2, and um, PGP especially have been validated to not only be present and a broad spectrum of additional um, molecules are present or the expression of a number of other transporters is present, but we've been able to show modulability of those. So if you look at OCT2, for example, which modulates cisplatin uptake, we can show that we've got cisplatin toxicity in this model 
and then if you block the uptake of cisplatin through the OC2 transporter, um, you actually see that toxicity go away. So if you look at the bottom images there, you see the intact epithelium uh, when you block the OC2 specifically. So thank you for your time. I'm going to hand off to the next presenter here, but I appreciate your attention.